Hallelujah. This morning, even as we come together for the word, I want to share with you something about. Can we have the slides on here, please? Can we as we want to continue to talk about being a community? So often in all our preaching, so often in all our teaching, we talk a lot about how the Lord has saved us, how the Lord has touched us, how the Lord has delivered us. But I want to tell you, if the Lord can do it for different ones of us individually, how much more will He do for us collectively as a community? Amen? Hallelujah! You know, and two Sundays ago, I talked to you about how we were created for community. And then I, I ended with, the, with, with this thing that we are created for community to declare His praises. And we just, we didn't elaborate on that because I wanted to continue it here this morning. But let's go on to what um, Pastor Sam talked to us last Sunday. You know, it was such an encouraging um, sermon that we had last Sunday by Pastor Sam. He talked about how we, we my empty, how sometimes we can be so empty and yet God is so plenty, you know. But I suppose the question we sometimes want to ask is, how do we move from our empty to God's plenty? How do we move from being empty to being filled by God? And this morning, I want to share with you something that the Lord has taught me, that you don't need to stay empty. You can be full of God's plenty simply by knowing this, that we have been created for community. You know, two Sundays ago on our ninth anniversary, I talked about how, you know, as we come to Christ as living stones, He's building us up into a spiritual house. We are a chosen generation. He has chosen you here. You didn't come here by accident. You were chosen here. You are a chosen group of people. Why? To be a royal priesthood. To not just represent people before God, but also bring God to people outside. Amen? You remember all those? And we are a holy nation set apart by God, set apart for Him, and so that our culture will be different from the culture of the people outside because we are people full of His grace, people full of His power dwelling in us. We can be different. Just as Mason just shared, we can be different because He is with us. And we are His special people. But there's one purpose that He has called us for. There's one purpose that He has called us for. And that is, we are to declare the praises of Jesus who did it all for us. We sometimes do it individually. We often do it in our own quiet moments. But, you know, we... The whole purpose of the new covenant is so that God may have a people, a community of people like you and me coming together like this to worship Him, to declare His praises. And there's so much power that we are missing because sometimes we miss this. You know, I'm not saying this in condemnation, but often we think that the worship in the morning is just a prelude, you know, just, just something to fill time before the pastor comes out and gives the message. The main thing is the message. Uh, so, we said, never mind. Uh, oh, 10, 15, uh, oh, let's go to church. We can still make it for the message. You know, how many of you think like that? <laughs> Don't put up your hands, I know. <laughs> okay. Or oh, oh, something like that. It doesn't matter. Oh, uh, we just make it in time, 11 o'clock message time. Okay, can, can, you know. You know? And then, uh, then after message, uh, oh, message finished already. Uh, uh, 12 o'clock, let's go out now, you know, quickly go. Don't have to finish with the worship. We, we think that worship is just an add-on, just a feel time, just a feeler. But I want to tell you, we are wrong. If you have that attitude, if you have that thinking, you are wrong. Because the scripture is very clear. First Peter 2 9 is very clear. That all for, so that we, we are a special people to declare the praises of Him who call out of the darkness into His marvelous light. We have only one function. We have, we have only one purpose, church, as a community, to declare His praises. And if, 
He can do so much for us individually. How much more can He do for us as a people when we learn this truth and hold on to this truth? Amen. So let's start. I want to introduce to you what it means for corporate worship. And I want to talk about very, a very old verse, Amos 9, verse 11 to 12. Say, Pastor, what is Amos? Amos cookies are no, no, no. no. <laughs> Amos is an Old Testament prophet who lived something like uh, 700 years after David. Or 300 years after David. 700 years before Jesus. Okay? So it's almost 3,000 years ago. 2,700 years ago. He said, Pastor, why you always tell history one? You know? Why you talk about history one? We are not, in his, not interested in history. We are interested in now. What's happening now? You know? But bear with me for a while. Then you'll see why history is so important. Amos chapter 9, verse 11. Let's all read it together. Huh? On that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. Amos, after David, after King David, declared that God will raise up the tabernacle of David. So what in the world is this tabernacle of David? What are we talking about here? Why did he refer to a tabernacle of David? We know that there is a tabernacle of Moses. We know there is a Solomon temple, you know. But what is this tabernacle of David? Now bear with me. I think if you, you just listen and don't turn off, you, 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 you will get very excited about what God wants to tell us. The tabernacle of David, we go to First Chronicles. How many of you ever read First Chronicles before? If not, this is the first time. Uh, uh, first time means good lah. Huh? At least you got first time reading Chronicles. Okay, okay. First Chronicles chapter fifteen, verse one. David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. And now you get a clue. See, David when he became king after Saul died and so on, so he became king. Then he built houses for himself. He built his palace and so on. And then he prepared a place for the ark of God. He built a tent. He built a tent for it. What happened actually? You know, during Saul's time, you know, the ark of God, the ark of the covenant, it represents the presence of God. And in the tabernacle of Moses, it was in the most holy place. But during Saul's time, because they were fighting with the Philistines, they thought if, you know, like a lucky charm, if we can take the ark of God there, maybe you'll win the battle. But they took the ark of God there and they still lost the battle because their hearts were away from God. And so the Philistines took the ark of covenant into Philistine, they put it into their temple, their, the statues all fall down, and then they put it in somewhere else, many people got sick, so finally they sent it back to Israel. But it, the king didn't dare to touch it. Saul didn't dare to touch it. He stayed in a place called uh, the house of one guy called Obed Edom. Okay? So, but David, David, because he was different from Saul, he had spiritual discernment. He understood God's heart. And he wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to God, back to Jerusalem. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the tabernacle of Moses was still there in, in Gibeon, in a place called Gibeon. And there, they were still offering sacrifices and so on. But there was no ark there. What does the ark of God, ark of, covenant, of the covenant, or ark of God represent? It represents the presence of God. Everybody say, presence of God. It represents the presence of God with the people. And David wanted to bring the presence of God back to Jerusalem, back to the city of David where he was. So, 
Sorry, I think I missed one verse. Never mind. Uh, then David spoke to the leaders of the Levites. So David wanted to. So he spoke to the Levites. He appointed the brethren to be singers. Everybody say singers. singers. Accompanied by instruments of music, string instruments, harps, and cymbals. By raising their voice with resounding joy. How are you going to sing? How are you going to sing to worship the Lord? You raise your voice, right? With what? Very sad, melancholy. No, with joy. Amen. You know, and that's what David told the people, told the Levites, you know, you appoint people to sing and make sure they raise your voice and sing with resounding joy. And so David and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went up went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with joy. Notice, it wasn't just the musicians going. The leaders of Israel, the king of Israel, the elders of Israel, you know, and the captains over thousands, all the generals and all, all colonels and everything else, all the top military people were all there to bring back the presence of God into the city of David. It consumed them. It was so important for all of them. They prioritized it, all of them. And the same thing you hear here, they bring back with joy. Can we say joy again? Joy. joy. Amen. You know, they brought back with joy. And that gives us a clue how worship is, what worship is all about. It's all about joy. Amen. Hallelujah. And thus, verse 28, thus all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn and with trumpets and with cymbals, making music with string instruments and harps. How many people from Israel? All Israel. How many people are supposed to worship God together? All of us. Amen. All of us are, good, are, are to be involved. You know, all of us have a responsibility to be involved. All of us are called to, to worship the Lord together. So all Israel brought up the covenant of the Lord with shouting, with great, with great joy, shouting, and with the sound of horn, the trumpet, cymbals, string instruments, and harps. You know, the whole orchestra was present. Amen. The wind instrument, the string instruments, the, the, the percussion, they were all there. The whole orchestra was present. Oh, you know, whole orchestra was there to bring up the Ark of the Covenant to the city of David. So it was a great occasion. All Israel is in war. So worship in the time of David all of Israel was in war. You know, but there was somebody else, all not so correct, because somebody else was not in war. So now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Micah, Saul's daughter, who is also David's wife, looked through a window and saw the king leaping and whirring before the Lord and she despised him in her heart. You know, David was so involved in worshipping the Lord. He was leaping. <laughs> Luckily, they fought. And he was swearing. <laughs> Almost fell down. And he was so involved. He was so excited about worshipping the Lord, bringing the presence of the Lord into the city. And yet, you know, you were taught all of Israel would have called got into that whole spirit. But there was my car. She was looking, she didn't get involved. She was looking down from her window and when she saw David jumping, leaping and singing, she despised David in her heart. You know, I have asked the Lord, I said, Lord, why do you record That's such a beautiful incident? Why do you record something like this in the scriptures. What's the purpose? So the Lord reminded me, He says, sometimes people despise the things I cherish. Sometimes we despise the things that God cherish, the things of God. 
And that's, and I thought that since it's, it's in the scriptures, I want to say a little bit about it, okay? So often, we take certain things that are so important to God, so important to our Father, to our, our Jesus. We take what His instructions for us lightly. Maybe we are not like Micah. Maybe we don't despise what is going on on Sunday morning. But sometimes we disregard it. You say, worship, uh, never mind. Uh, let the rest of them go. Uh, you know, I come a bit late. Uh, you know? Or sometimes you say, oh, we, we downplay it. Not so important. Uh, you know? Let them do first. Uh, I don't have to participate. Uh, checking my latest WhatsApp message, more important than worshiping the Lord. Uh. You could be here physically, but you, you downplay it. It's not so important, uh, you know. Or, or you could just disregard it completely and just do what you want to do on a Sunday morning, even though you may be here on time. I'm not saying this in condemnation, okay? Uh, but I just say, I want to just, just share with you because it's in the scriptures. My car Look out the window. She saw David rejoicing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. And later when David went home, he got a shelling from Micah. But David stood his ground and said, I will do what pleases the Lord. But the consequence, you know, there are consequences to our actions. The consequence of Micah despising the things that God cherished was that Micah, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Sometimes we wonder, why are we unfruitful in our ministries, in the things we do in our workplace, in, in, in the things around us? Maybe it's a time to check ourselves. Perhaps this is a time to check ourselves. Am I cherishing the things that God cherished in my life? Amen? Do we cherish what the Father cherished? Do we cherish what our Lord Jesus cherished? Or we are, are we despising it? Are we dis disregarding it? Or are we downplaying it? And we do this, when we, when, we, when we don't cherish what God cherished, we can become unfruitful, just as Micah became unfruitful. Amen? So, First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 1, So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. You know, so this is the tabernacle that Amos was talking about. This was a tent that Amos was talking about. This was a tent where there was now a tent just set up for the Ark of the Covenant. Like I said, David's tabernacle was here with the Ark of the Covenant, representing the presence of God there. Right there on the other side, in Gibeon, was the tabernacle of Moses, where they were still doing the sacrifices no presence of God. You understand? Side by side, it was occurring. And so, when it was there, David blessed the people in the name of the Lord. You know, every time we come into the presence of God together as a community, we are blessed. Why? Because His presence is with us. We are blessed. And that's why David blessed the people, not, not as king, but in the name of the Lord. Every time you come here and worship the Lord together with the whole community, I want to tell you, you are blessed. Amen. Every time we come together to worship together, we are blessed. Every time we come together, and I like the way... Uh, Elvin shed led us in communion this morning. He said, 
together as a community, we partake of the communion together. Individually, there's so much power in the partaking of the communion. But together, when we declare together what Christ has done for us, so much more power. Amen. Hallelujah. They are blessed. And not just that, you know, at, when the ark was in, in the tabernacle, David distributed to everyone of Israel, both men and, every, and women, to everyone. You know, the Bible is so clear here. Three times it says, if you miss it, you miss it, okay? It says, how many people of Israel? Everyone of Israel. Only the men? No. Men and women, to everyone. Amen. Everyone are blessed. Amen. What are they blessed? He gave to everybody a loaf of bread, a piece of, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. A loaf of bread. This morning, we took the bread of life. Amen? Jesus. You, know, you see Jesus, even in simple things like Jesus. You know, a piece of meat. His body was broken for us so that we may be whole. And I want to believe that this morning, as different ones partook of the bread of life, representing the body of Jesus, so many will be healed. Amen? Hallelujah. And a cake of raisins. You know, how are raisins made? From grapes, isn't it? You know, what's the first picture when you think of the spies returning from Jordan? What were they carrying? They're carrying a bunch of grapes on, on the shoulders of two men across a bar. Yeah? Grapes. Grapes talking about what? Fruitfulness. Harvest. Great fruitfulness. Plenty. Amen. Good things in life. Raisins. When you squeeze out raisins, you get grape juice. Uh, squeeze the grapes, you get raisins. And then the juice becomes grape juice. It becomes good wine. Amen? Life. Beautiful things in life. I, I'm not one to drink a lot of wine. Some, some of you do. But I know they, they all chase after good wine all the time. Good things in life. And David gave everybody a picture of what Jesus can bring to all of us. A loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. Hallelujah! God is good, isn't it? Amen. And he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the Ark of the Lord, to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the God of Israel. When we gather, it's not just karaoke time now, please. Huh? It's not about just singing karaoke, you know. It's not karaoke time. When we gather, it is to minister before the Ark of God, the Lord. In the Old Covenant, all they had was the Ark of the Lord to represent the presence of God. Today, we know that He is in our midst. Amen? He is in our midst. And when we come together to worship before Him, it is to minister before Him. Amen. Hallelujah. And the three things they list down there, to commemorate. To commemorate is to remember and to celebrate, isn't it? When you commemorate, commemorate something, you remember you remember what Jesus has done and you celebrate it through song, through, through, through dance and through all the all of your whole being. You want to commemorate all that Jesus has done and you also want to thank Him because it is not what He has done for others but he, it is also what He has done for you. Amen. And to praise Him for who He is, the loving, good, Saviour, Redeemer that He is to all of us. Hallelujah. He appointed some of the Levites to minister before the Ark of the Lord, to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the God of Israel. Then Asap the chief, and next to him, Zechariah, then Zia, then Shimiramov, Jehiel, Matitaya, Eliab, Benaiah, and Obedino. You know, he put down all the worship leaders. You know, all those different worship leaders, he put them all down, all the leaders of the worship team. 
And then Zia with string instruments and harps, Esa made music with cymbals, and Benana Jehiah the priest regularly blew the trumpets before the ark of God. You know, the whole, the whole, as I said, the whole orchestra was involved in this. Sorry. Sorry, 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 ah. Huh? So, sometimes we forget that for many of us, as, as I said, it's so easy to just come on time. Huh? So easy for us to make that little effort to come, come on time. But you know, for the worship that we have every Sunday morning like this, our worship team comes on Saturday, sometimes from 4 to 6, 6.30 to practice. Okay? And then they come the next morning, on Sunday morning, probably 8.30, 8.45, also to practice, to make sure everything runs well before the rest of you come. Some of you who have come a bit earlier, you have heard them practicing inside here. So, we want to appreciate now all those who are in our worship team, can we just ask them, whoever is in our worship team, just to stand? Can you stand? And we just want to give you thanks and praise, not just for today, but all those different ones who are in the worship team. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We want to thank the Lord for all of you that in different ways that you have been such a blessing to us, sacrificing your time, you know, practicing to make sure that we have a great time of worship together. But you know, Besides the worship team, you know, to make Sunday possible, there's always, there's also the sound and the, the AV technicians and, you know, all those in the background. You don't see them on stage. We should give them and thank the Lord, even for a greater, you know, all the cameramen, the ushers and so on. Different ones who have always made this possible. The technicians have made this possible behind the scenes always. You know, we are so grateful that the Lord in His own way in his grace have brought so many of them all together you know we started if you know how we started our worship team you 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 laugh you know we actually we actually don't have people who actually have led worship or played in front of a congregation before when we first started but over the last nine years the lord has built built up a team for us that is so such such a blessing to all of us you know and we just give thanks to the lord uh, for all of them you know? And to the worship team, you know, don't think you're just somebody playing the keyboard, somebody just drumming away, you know, nobody really recognizes you, nobody knows you, you know, the Lord knows you, you know. Ah, all the worship leaders and all those musicians of David's day, they, their names are all there just now. Yeah, you saw them, you know, they, uh, they're all there. The Lord takes down notes for everybody who takes part. Whether other people see or don't see, the Lord sees. Amen. Hallelujah. But let's move on. So he said, but Pastor, this is Old Testament, uh, uh, Old Covenant, uh, 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 King David, uh, Amos, uh, Chronicles. Uh, I don't know all these names or so. Never read all these books before. So what does it mean for me? Okay, but I want you to refer back to Amos again, okay? The Amos prophecy again. On that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does these things. Now, so, after David, David wanted to build a temple for God. God said, no, you are a man of war, you don't build it. So, commissioned the son to build it, okay? So, the son finished the tabernacle at the temple of Solomon. So the Ark of the Covenant was then moved into the temple. And so what happened to David's tent? It fell to ruins. Okay? And so when the temple was built, so worship went back to the old covenant ways again. You got to wash your feet, sacrifice and all that. Only the Levites, only the priests can go in and all that. So and all the worship around the tabernacle, around the Ark of the Covenant, in the tabernacle of David, 
was lost. Right? Everybody after a while forgot about it. But God didn't forget. God said, on that day, one day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David. But he said, Pastor, this is old covenant. So what has that got to do with me? Well, in Acts chapter 15, Acts, you know, is when the church have already started, right? And the church moved from Jerusalem, out of Jerusalem to different places. And one of the centers that it was in was a town called Antioch. And from Antioch, the gospel spread to other towns all over the Roman Empire. And Paul was from Antioch. And so, but then the people in Jerusalem sent some people to Antioch and said, hey, you are not doing the right thing. For people to become Christians, they must first become Jews. They must be circumcised first. How can you don't circumcise them? Don't ask me why circumcision. Huh? <laughs> Embarrassing to say now. But they, you know, they, you know, uh, so the, the, there was a big argument. And so Paul and Barnabas decided to go to Jerusalem and meet with the apostles who, who were still there. And they had a big council. And then they came to a decision. And James, the brother of uh, Jesus, who was there was the leader of that church there in Jerusalem. And so he answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. And tell them, that because of this problem, this is what we're going to do. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. You guess, which scripture did James quote? James said, this is the, what the prophet said. He didn't say prophet Amos, but he said, what are the prophets said? He said, after this, I will return and build the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, say this, says the Lord who does all these things. Hallelujah! You know, God has included us inside this. And today, you know, the Jews had only maybe 30, 40 years or 50 years of experiencing free worship around the throne of God, around the presence of God. Today, we, the Gentiles, you and me, are now called by the name of Jesus. And we have that same privilege and more to worship Him in His presence always. Hallelujah. So, just as an aside, sometimes, uh, young people, you must read your Bible. Uh, uh, and you don't be afraid of Amos, Chronicles and all that because they have a good message for all of us. And then when you see it, it as a whole, suddenly say, wow, so chuna, so good, you know. He has good plans. And sometimes his plans spread over centuries. Centuries and, and millenniums. So don't be afraid. He knows all things. He has good plans for you and for all of us. Amen. Amen. It isn't just Acts 15. Hebrews 10, 24, 25 tells us this. Let us consider one another. You know, in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, there are 14 times he said, let us, let us, 14 times. Meaning what? Let us together as a community. Let us together as a church. Let us together as a group of believers as a spiritual house, as a chosen generation, as, as, as a royal priesthood, as a special people, let us together. You know, it is not about individ doing it individually. Yes, we can worship individually. But the scripture, the new covenant, basis of God relating to us. Yes, we are all safe individually. But we are called, as we come to Him, we are built into a spiritual house. It is always about being together as a community. 
Amen. So he said, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Why do we come together? So that we may learn to love one another more. That we may learn how to be encouraging one another into good works. You know, some people tell me, say, Pastor, why sometimes you preach about having to love or having to do good works and so on. Isn't that, you know, going back to works? Hey, not me, la. the writer of Hebrews said this. La. Huh? Right or not? The writer of Hebrews said this, isn't it? Huh? Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. And if you know the meaning of the word stir up, huh? you know, you all never watched cowboy movies. When I was growing up, we watched cow cowboy movies. You know, the cowboys, at the, at the back of their shoes, they have these stir ups, huh? this, this, this little... Uh, blades here, yeah, uh, round blades, you know. So every time they want the horse to move faster, uh, they kick the horse, uh, the horse go, uh, yeah. <laughs> the horse runs very fast in front, okay? The horse runs in, uh, and runs fast. So what the scripture is saying that, let us consider one another. Let's kick one another if they are not, not, not showing love. Kick one another if not doing good works, you know. Basically, that, uh, let us encourage, uh, let us strongly encourage one another. Don't be paise to encourage one another. Don't be shy to encourage one another towards love and good works. Amen? Let us stir up. But not just that. He reminds us, the writer of Hebrew reminds us, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, by exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. So, do not neglect. Not that we want to have a big church. Not that we want to have many numbers. Okay? Numbers are good for different purposes. But really, the scripture tells us do not neglect the coming together. Don't have any excuse. Got this, got that. Don't come. Lah, you know? When you don't come, two things happen. You miss out worshipping together. That's what the Lord asks you to do. You also miss out the opportunity to encourage, to stir up somebody in love and good works. Amen? So let's make it a priority coming Sunday after Sunday. Amen? Don't say, I got quota, la, Pastor. Once a month, good enough. La. Twice a month, good enough. La. You know, no. <laughs> the Bible says, do not neglect, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Amen? Hallelujah. And I want to close with this verse now. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in a time of need. And this is another one of the letters again, okay? Let us therefore come boldly. Let us come. Let us... It is actually a Levitical invitation. It is the priestly invitation. Let us come and minister before the Lord. Let us come boldly and minister before the Lord. Let us, as a people of God, come and worship before the Lord. You get, you get the sense of what he's saying now? Huh? Let us come as a people of God, as a community of believers, at His royal priesthood. Let us come boldly. We all together, we are all the royal priesthood. We all together come boldly before God. Okay? To where? To the throne of grace. To the throne of God. The throne of God is not a throne of judgment. It's not just throne of rulership, but thank God, it is a throne of grace. It is a throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. You now, Sunday after Sunday, we celebrate the communion and we know that Jesus has finished the work for us. He has finished paying for our sins. He has finished all that needs to be done in regards to our sins and our sin. And so, the Bible says, as we come together to worship Him together, as we come together to worship Him together in the throne of grace, we, that we may obtain mercy. The word obtain sounds like 
you know, you go for a brim, they give, give you, you know, <laughs> brim money, obtain, you know. But the word obtain in Greek means um, lambano, uh, it's lambano, which means you take hold of, you seize the mercy that is offered to you. Hallelujah. Mercy, if you are feeling condemned this morning, if you're feeling no good this morning, the Lord says to you, as you come and worship me together with everybody else, you will know what it means to be forgiven completely. Hallelujah! That Jesus has done all that was possible for us. Amen. It goes out and find grace. Find grace. The word find is also a very weak word. Actually, the Greek is Greek is something like eure eurexi, eureka. You know, when you find something precious, when you find something unexpectedly, you say, wow, eureka! You know, you, 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 it is something, and that's what it means. God's grace. When you know God's grace, when you find His grace for you, you suddenly want to rise up and jump and say, Eureka, you find grace. When you worship together, when you come boldly to worship before His throne of grace, we not just obtain mercy, but we find a surprising grace. Grace that exceeds our expectations. Grace that shows how good God is, how wonderful God is, how great He is to us. In our time of need, sometimes we think that in our time of need is, you know, but the, the, the actual, the original language means, you know, at the right time when you need it most. Not before, not after the thing has passed, but at a time when you need His grace most. Hallelujah. To help. To help. Is used only one other time. This phrase is only used one other time in the New Testament. There was in Acts 27, I think, when Paul was sailing and they were facing a storm. And so the ship was going to give way. So they put the ropes around the ship to help to hold it together so that the ship would not break up. You know, some of you this morning may be thinking, you know, my life is breaking up. I can't handle this anymore. You know, the pressures are too, too many bad things happening to me this, this, this week. My business is failing. My relationship is breaking up. My boss is, you know, just unfair to me. You know, things, I'm, I can't hold it up anymore. The scripture says, let us, let us, therefore come boldly. Let us therefore come together before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find His surprising, His wonderful grace to help to hold our lives together in this time of need. Amen. Amen. This morning, we may have not heard something like this before, but corporate worship Coming together worship is not just something that you want to do, you feel like doing, you do. You feel like, you know, but there is so much more for us. If we can only understand what the Lord has in store for us when we come together as a people like this. And I want to believe for all of us here too, that as we come together like this, God is going to do something wonderful. Let's not be like my car standing and folding our arms and despising all that is going on or disregarding all that God is doing in our midst. But let's, let us heed the scriptures that we do not forsake the assembling of each of us. Do not forsake the assembling together as a people of God. Let us therefore come boldly before His throne of grace in worship, in praise and thanksgiving. And just as the people in David's time Receive gifts from David. The loaf of bread, the piece of meat, and the cake of raisins. I believe that every time we come together as a people of God, worshipping Him, we will receive. Amen. There's so much more He has for us. So much surprises He has for us. 
His that we may we may find grace to help in our time of need. His grace will enable us to hold our lives together. Amen. It may seem to be breaking at the ages. Things don't seem to work out well. But at the right time, His grace will come. You believe that? His grace will help us hold our lives together. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, some of you miss the beautiful worship, part of the beautiful worship this morning. So I told the worship team, Life has, let's have a, a slightly extended time of worship together as we close. And I trust that all of us will stay back, you know, and not just for this Sunday, but every Sunday because corporate worship is so important. If you want to move from, if you want to move from, oops, can I have the slides please, the last slide? If you want to move from our empty to God's plenty, it is when we gather together around the throne of grace, praising Him, declaring the praises of Jesus together. Amen.